Yeah, sometimes it's um, hard to see which side you'd reset. So like a KC here, 0.288 slightly favors the reactants. So you may or may not reset this one. You, you can reset it to reduce the number of binomials to make the algebra a little bit easier. But here, you know, the simplifying assumptions is bound to fail. Whereas if you look at number 44, this is heavily biased towards the reactants. So resetting this to the reactants <coughs> will be beneficial. And the simplifying assumption is likely to work here. Here, K is 4. You know, it's hard to say if it helps or not. So we have those. And then we have KPs. KPs are pretty much the same setup as KC. The only difference is you're using pressures instead of uh, concentrations. But otherwise, everything else is pretty much the same. Le Chatelet's, uh, Le Chatelet's we're going to do qualitatively in these problems. So what direction does it shift? So this is kind of like the lab. Um, very big and very small K values. Very small, reset it to the left. Very big, reset it to the right. General, general procedure. Sometimes these K values are so huge, like K equals 10 to the 20th. You know, we assume that amide, amide's a strong base. Strong bases hydrolyze water completely. But when we look at the KB, the KB is not infinity. If the KB were infinity, then this would be 100% reaction. The KB is 10 to the 20th. Still a huge amount. So what they're asking you is to calculate the equilibrium concentrations and then see. You know, does it make sense? So if you had a liter of water, would you have any amide in there? What would the concentration be? And the answer is you'd have no. Most likely there's no amide in there, otherwise the concentration would be too high. And a few other type problems. This is just mole ratio. Bring out K. I think I signed an E3. Pretty sure. Then we have these. These are engineering equations. So these, <coughs> if you do a lot of these types of calculations, will make your life um, a little bit easier. But if you don't do a lot, then you know, maybe it's not so necessary. And so they simplify some of these um, equations here. So rather than doing the ice table and everything else, they come up with a simple equation here that kind of does the same thing. The same thing here. They're not gonna, we're not going to do the ice, but we can always do the ice table. And in fact, it's, if you don't do a lot of these, it's just not even worth memorizing additional equations like this to do these types of calculations. But, you know, it's, it's nice to do one of them so you know what they look like. So that's chapter 15. Um, now we're moving on to chapter 16, and that's the topic of today's lab pretty much. We're going to do the experiment first, and then we're going to do some calculations. And we'll go through the calculations together. So you could either work individually, or you can work with a partner. I think we might have enough pH meters. Um, have you guys used LabQuest? No? No? We're going to use the LabQuest system. Just a little, little tablet-based data acquisition system. And um, we're going to check that out from the stock room. Uh, you, might have, you might have used it for calorimetry. Do you guys remember taking temperature measurements with time, like every one minute or something? You probably used the LabQuest system to do that. And so it automatically records the temperature for you. Okay. So we're going to check that out from the stock room. You can... Um, you can work solo if you want. I think we, ha we should have enough. And then uh, come back and then we'll uh, talk about how to calibrate it. So go ahead and go check it out and then we'll start again after everybody's got, gotten their equipment. Uh, which one of these readings is most accurate? Do you know which one? Is it the low one, 172, or the high one, 2.00? Which one is the most accurate or neither of those? Can you tell me by looking at it? No. 
So the best thing we do is we just take lots of measurements. You know, if we can, if we can take an infinite number of measurements, then we could eliminate random error. You know, because we'll just take the average. The average you will have should have an equal amount of high readings and low readings. But you know what? I, I should probably wait until. People are done. Well, I'll just continue talking. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the average. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, say that the um, systematic error is negligible because we properly calibrated it. And we get an average of pH of 180, 89, or 190. for acetic acid and an average pH of 773 for sodium acetate. Do you know what pH neutral is? Um, what pH is neutral? 7. So if we have a pH less than 7, we call it acidic or basic? Acidic. So pH is less than 7. Um, and so if we look at it, it looks like uh, acetic acid is fairly acidic. Now pHs are power functions and they go by powers of 10. So if we're at 7 and we go to 2, that's 5 powers of 10. 5 powers of 10 is about 100,000 times. So this is about 100,000 times more acidic than pH 7. However, you look at the sodium acetate and the sodium acetate is just slightly more basic. You know. It's about one power of 10, so it's about 10 times more basic, but less than that. So that's a pH. All right, uh, so. Do you, uh, Tristan, do you guys have more, um, many more to read? Or this the last one? Okay. Then um, let me talk for a little bit about the calculation here. The pH measures the equilibrium what? Equilibrium concentration. And so what we're going to do is from the pH, um, we're going to calculate the equilibrium hydronium concentration. And the equilibrium hydronium concentration is going to equal 10 to the minus pH molar. And so I'm just going to uh, take care of this. This is going to be negative 1.895. And I'm going to take the um, inverse log base 10 or just raise it 10 to the x power. And so I get an equilibrium uh, hydronium concentration of 0 0.01273. Um, there are more digits, so I'm just going to carry, let's see. I have, um, how many sig figs do I have in this? Now with power functions, is weird. Everything after, after the decimal is significant, so I should only have two sig figs here. And so I'm really only allowed two sig figs here. So I'm going to carry two extra here to minimize rounding error. So that's the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium. So what I'm going to do in Chem 1B uh, style stoichiometry, I'm going to set up my ice table. I'm going to abbreviate acetic acid as HAC. AC is the standard abbreviation for acetate. So I'll just do HAC plus water. We call this a Ka equation. Ka equation, this is acid hydrolysis. This is going to form H3O plus and acetate. All right. Um, OK, if you still have your pH equipment, you'll, you'll need to return that to the stock room.
in, in a minute. Okay, so we set up our ice table like this. This is acid hydrolysis, acid and water. Acid hydrolysis, Ka. The Ka is going to equal the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium times the acetate ion concentration at equilibrium divided by the HAC concentration at equilibrium. Like that. Um, we know the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium. It's 0 0.01273. And so the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium is 0 0.01273 molar to two sig figs. I'm carrying extra to avoid rounding error. Now, did you write the uh, initial concentration? What is the concentration marked on the bottle of acetic acid? Three molar. Three molar. Is that to one sig fig, two sig figs, three sig figs? Is it, or did it just say three molar, that's it? Did it say 3.0 molar? Can somebody, it's just three, okay. If it's just three, three molar is, is just one sig fig, so that isn't very precise. You know, if we see three molar, three molar varies from what to what. So three molar means that the actual concentration can be anywhere from 2.5 to 3.4 molar. That's a huge range. And so we, we typically like more precision than this, but I guess that's as best as we're going to do. What's the initial concentration of H2O liquid? It's a pure liquid, so its concentration is not going to change, and therefore we're going to omit it from the ice table. So H2O liquid we don't care about. The initial concentration of hydronium is zero molar. And the way we visualize this is initially we make this three molar by adding three moles of acetic acid to a liter. And then uh, we allow it to hydrolyze water. But in reality, it just happens all at once. And so this is kind of just a thought or a mental experiment here. So we're going to assume that nothing's happened. We add the acetic acid to water, the acetic acid hydrolyzes water, and then we'll see some product. In that hydrolysis, we're going to lose X molar acetic acid. It's a weak acid, so it doesn't completely hydrolyze. And then over here, we're going to gain X molar plus X molar. The bigger the X is, the stronger the acid. That is, the stronger the acid, the more hydrolysis. The more hydrolysis, the more change. That is, the more... Um, ionization or hydrolysis. And so this is going to be 3 minus x molar. And uh, this is equal to x molar. And if we know that the concentration of hydronium, then we know the concentration of acetate. Because the acetate concentration has to be the same. So the acetate is going to be 0.01273. And the acetic acid is going to be 3 minus 0 0.01273, which is going to give us 2.9, 2 .9 all right, now we can calculate what Ka is. Ka is going to be 0 0.01273 squared divided by 5.437 times 10 to the negative 5. 
we're only allowed two sig figs, so I'm going to round this to 5.4 times 10 to the negative 5. And so this is the experimental de determination of Ka we just did here. The accepted value of Ka is um, for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So we're pretty we're pretty far off. But it could be, you know, the solution was pretty far off. The solution could have been way off from 3 molar. Mm, screwing up our results. And if, if you only have to make it to 3 molar, you don't have to be very precise. So we could calculate our percent error. Our percent error is going to be big. Um, this is going to be greater than 100% error. This is not great. All right, so this is determination of Ka. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to determine the equilibrium concentrations given Ka. So we're going to determine the equilibrium concentrations, the pH, and uh, the percent hydrolysis. Did you guys return it already? Okay. Yeah, um, I'm going to set up the equation here. So you guys go go ahead and return it. Equipment. I guess we're almost out of time anyway. Well, the stock room is going to be closing, so that's why I returned that before the stock room closes. I'll finish up the calculations next time. Um, but what we'll do, I uh, just wanted to make a couple of announcements this time. The first one is this. Uh, normally, I don't like to post the key because it's, you know, it's kind of open book. If it's open book, you should be able to figure out if you have the correct answer or not just by researching it a bit in the book. And th that's useful because what you want to do is you want to understand the material enough so that you can determine if your answer is right or wrong. That is, you know, if you set it up correctly or, or not. You, it, there could still be an algebraic error, but as long as the setup is, is correct, then, then it's good. But um, for this test, I decided I'll just go ahead and throw the key on there. Since um, some people are further behind in their study than, than they probably um, hoped. The other thing I wanted to mention is this. On this old exam, On number six, it's hard to read.
Oh, I have the key here. I can't open the original exam, but uh, for H2O liquid goes to H2O gas. So this is boiling. We talked about boiling water. Boil, what's the boiling point of water? The boiling point of water is 100 degrees C, right? But that's under normal conditions. What are normal conditions? Normal conditions are one atmosphere of pressure, not two atmospheres. And so for boiling water at 100 degrees C, this happens spontaneously at one atmosphere, but if we increase the pressure to two atmospheres, is it going to be spontaneous? No. It's going to be a lot more pressure. We're going to need a higher temperature in order to get a vapor pressure this high. And so, um, so in other words, uh, delta G is going to be non-spontaneous. So that's what I have over here. This is non-standard conditions. Delta G is non-spontaneous that is greater than zero. But I also have this one over here, and that is delta G under standard conditions is equal to zero. Now, this is true because um, under standard conditions, the pressure should be one atmosphere. If the pressure is one atmosphere, then water boils at 100 degrees C spontaneously. So this is, this is true. Does that make sense? even though we're under non-standard conditions. And so this is like saying, you know, the speed limit on Crenshaw is 35 miles an hour. But let's say a car is going 40 miles an hour. Did that change the speed limit? No. And so this is saying the speed limit is this, but we're going, you know, 40. But it doesn't matter. The speed limit's the same. Now, you could argue this is false. You could argue this is false because standard conditions is not really one atmosphere. Standard conditions is one bar. And actually water, you know, one bar is like 0.9 something atmosphere, so it's a little less, so you don't need as much temperature. And so water boils at 99.5 degrees Celsius um, from our calculation earlier. And so what this means is that delta G naught is slightly less than zero because we're at a little higher temperature. And so you got to argue that. If that's the case, if the question is ambiguous like that, then just make a little note on the exam so I could see what you're thinking. And so if you're thinking, ah, this is close, but I don't know. Are you, is he talking about bar or is he talking about atmosphere? Since that's a little bit confusing, then, um, then make a little note here. Delta G naught would e equal zero if, you know, standard pressure is one atmosphere, or delta G naught would be slightly less than zero or less than zero if, if we're at uh, a bar. Okay. All right, so that's what I wanted to um, talk about for the test. But the keys posted... Also, um, you can go through this. I'm having an extra office hour tonight from 9 to 10 p.m. Uh, using WebEx. So just a reminder for that if you're interested in attending. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, finish this calculation here. So what we're going to do is uh, the other type of calculation we do with Ka, and that is we get the equilibrium concentrations, the pH and the percent hydrolysis given Ka, and the initial concentration of acid. And so, uh, again, we'll just set up the ice table here, HA plus H2O. This is acid hydrolysis. Acid plus water yields hydronium plus A minus. Now, um, this is acetic acid, so HA is generic acid, HAC is for acetic acid. And we'll have A minus. Now we're going to use the accepted value for Ka. The accepted value is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. These are compiled into tables. So we just look this up in a table. Now the initial concentration that we're given is 3 molar. Water is a pure liquid. We're going to assume nothing's happened, so this is 0 and 0. So the change is going to be minus x molar plus x molar plus x molar and so at equilibrium I'm going to have 3 minus x x and x Ka is going to equal the hydronium ion concentration equilibrium times the acetate concentration equilibrium divided by the H AC concentration equilibrium. And this is going to equal x squared divided by 3 minus x. Now, normally if there's some chance that the simplifying assumption works, I go ahead and use it. 
So if I think the simplifying assumption is going to work, I'll try it. And if it fails, then I'll back up. And so I'm going to try the SA. And that is, I'm going to say X is much smaller than 3. I don't know if that's true. But we're going to justify it using the percent change. So this is going to simplify into X squared over 3. And that makes solving for X a lot easier. And therefore, X is equal to 3 times 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So 3 times 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Oops. Um, take the square root of that. Answer. And I get x is equal to 0 0.01067. Okay, then we calculate the percent change. The percent change is equal to the change, which is going to be x over... 3, the initial, times 100%. And so I'll take the, my answer, divide by 3 times 100. And the percent change came out to 0.35%. A small percent change like this means it's pretty good. So even if we use the quadratic, our answer is not going to be that all that much different. And so this is a pretty decent answer. And I'm going to get 3... Uh, minus point oh one oh six seven it's two point nine eight nine two point nine eight nine three three molar and then this is going to be point oh ten sixty seven molar point oh ten sixty seven molar okay then we're going to double check the k which is going to be x squared so divided by this so I'm going to flip what I have in my calculator times point oh ten point oh ten sixty seven squared Oh, that K came out wrong. 3.8 times 10 to the minus 5. I, <clears throat> that's way off. So if it's this far off, I'm going to double check to make sure I didn't make a mistake because m my simplifying assumptions seem pretty good. And so I must have made some mistake here because it should be 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. I'm getting 3.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And so I would double check my calculation because, so I'm going to try it again. 0 0.01067 squared divided by point, or 2 point, divided by 2, 2.989, 3, 3. And it's all. So anyway, I'm out of time, so I'm not going to be able to find it right now. So we'll stop here. So if you have any questions, um, well, it's my office, half hour now. So I'll be here till 4.55 or uh, tonight, you know, from between 9 and 10 by WebEx.